Speeches and Letters of Abraham Lincoln, 1832-1865, edited by Merwin Rowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melvin Lee. Address in Independence Hall, Philadelphia, February 22, 1861. I am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing in this place where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle from which sprang the institutions under which we live. You have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to our distracted country. I can say in return, sir, that all the political sentiments I entertain have been drawn so far as i have been able to draw them from the sentiments which originated in and were given to the world from this hall i have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the declaration of independence i have often pondered over the dangers which were incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that declaration i have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the army who achieved that independence i have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this confederacy so long together it was not the mere matter of separation of the colonies from the motherland but that sentiment in the declaration of independence which gave liberty not alone to the people of this country but hope to all the world for all future time it was that which gave promise that in due time the weights would be lifted from the shoulders of all men and that all should have an equal chance this is the sentiment embodied in the declaration of independence now my friends can this country be saved on that basis if it can i will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if i can help to save it if it cannot be saved upon that principle, it will be truly awful. But if this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle, I was about to say I would rather be assassinated on this spot than surrender it. Now, in my view of the present aspect of affairs, there is no need of bloodshed and war. There is no necessity for it. I am not in favor of such a course and I may say in advance that there will be no bloodshed unless it is forced upon the government. The government will not use force unless force is used against it. My friends, this is wholly an unprepared speech. I did not expect to be called on to say a word when I came here. I supposed I was merely to do something toward raising a flag. I may, therefore, have said something indiscreet but I have said nothing but what I am willing to live by, and if it be the pleasure of Almighty God to die by. End of Address in Independence Hall by Abraham Lincoln The Living Speech by F. H. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrari. The Living Speech by F. H. The American Language, a Preliminary Inquiry into the Development of English in the United States by H. L. Mencken, New York, A. A. Knott. Never has the flourishing personality of H. L. Mencken been so happily exercised as in this big book on the living speech of america in mr mencken there is something of the pedant and something of the anarchist this book is compounded of both it is the benign pedant voracious and systematic and indefatigable that has accumulated and organized the large mass of material that has gone into the volume and it is the anarchist that has breathed fire into it this anarchist however is not of the sallow kind he is jocund and expansive a samson in girth and a samson to send torches among the philistines 
he delights in raciness and has no fear of the grossest barbarism yet he is cheerfully contemptuous of what he calls the yokelry and the stupid populace and the gaping proletariat he believes in a law at least to the extent of ascertaining it he uses the tools of pedantry to give himself mastery but he steers between the populace on one hand and professor balderdash on the other the result is a work which it is a platitude to call refreshing but which is actually refreshing in the deep sense as well as the obvious h l mencken is a pioneer he turns on the language we habitually use the mind and the imagination of a fresh inquirer an inquirer whose sophistication cannot be seriously questioned yet an inquirer who is not indentured to sophistication and out of that fresh inquiry we are enabled to form a new view of our own spoken and written language mr mencken untiringly helps us to comprehend much that is obscure and irregular in the shifting courses of american expression the living speech is a mississippi which cannot easily be charted but mr mencken is a pilot who knows the new channels as well as the old who steers on with the true current of the living stream many of us have no serene conviction in the matter of new idiom and new spelling and new locution we grope rather blindly among the tendencies we are favoring and the tendencies we are resisting we respond and we draw away but we do not rationalize mr mencken comes titanically to our aid necessarily disregarding the prudes and the scholastic rhetoricians he has opened his mind to receive every conceivable kind of data respecting the language now in use among the people of america and with these usages to argue from he has created at least the beginning of an american rationale this does not mean that the american language is sentimental radicalism it is true that mr mankin is hyperbolic at the beginning he talks of the english dialect and the american dialect and he quotes someone who dwells on the growing difficulties of intercommunication also he enjoys showing the enormous difference between unsophisticated american and sophisticated english and he rather gleefully foreshadows the day when me see she will be common and therefore sound american usage without a parallel investigation of unsophisticated usages in english i do not see how one can rest with such a conclusion it is amusing to hurl the stink-pot of popular americanisms among the grammarians but whitechapel and the mile end road and the coombe and the rookeries of glasgow could furnish similar weapons the erosions of inflected speech are nominally more significant in america because language has a general uniformity throughout the country but it is one thing to produce the evidence of a common illiteracy another thing to prove that the illiteracy is destined to supplant the corresponding literacy it is useless to dismiss the growing peculiarities of the american vocabulary and of grammar and syntax in the common speech as vulgarisms beneath serious notice yes if the peculiarities are definitely growing but the actual repetition of a misuse from mouth to mouth is only one factor in deciding its eventual triumph does the misuse work that is the qualitative test which must be met by such lazy and illogical locutions as me see she but the great distinction of mr mencken's book is his the bee staying him pragmatic method there are few forms in use he quotes lonsbury which judged by a standard previously existing would not be regarded as gross barbarisms this extreme statement mr mencken stupendously vindicates in all the luxurious minutiae of his inquiry there is an impartial and scholarly use of evidence yet his work cannot help serving as an antidote to snobs and snobbishness 
the attempt to make american uniform with english has failed ingloriously the neglect of its investigation is an evidence of snobbishness that is a folly of the same sort these and simpler snobbishnesses are constantly corrected in his pages every one knows the superior smile with which people who have the right shibboleth glance at one another when an outsider commits himself in their hearing yet how often the right shibboleth is the index to the silliest kind of group complacency mr mencken exhibits many barbarisms such as to ambition to compromit to happify right alongside them he prints words elevated to the peerage that were once similarly humble commoners to advocate to progress to oppose to derange to appreciate and value lengthy dutiable reliable bogus influential presidential these were plebeians to start with equally bad form and equally disdained the same formalism is to be found in spelling of course and very often to-day an inherited american barbarism is cherished by the very person who shudders at a more recent one in grammar as mr minton says there is also a formalism that is artificial illogical and almost unintelligible a formalism borrowed from english grammarians and by them brought into english against all fact and reason from the latin his list of popular conjugations partly derived from professor ring lardner is a perfect museum of barbarism it is also an extraordinary exhibition of professional zeal the great value of the american language is indeed its sagacious thoroughness it covers every sort of american idiosyncrasy in idiom in spelling in pronunciation in grammar in slang to do so with piquancy was natural to mr mencken but the delight of the volume is its workmanship and mr mencken is not less marvellous in his ingenious generalizing than in his inexhaustible information he is not omniscient he himself uses the archaic form round instead of round he is surely not right in saying that the english vegetable marrow is the same thing as squash he leaves out the american ride as an equivalent to the english drive motor ride he says the english call a napkin a serviette and a coal scuttle a coal hod few english do he says diggings is american for habitation whereas it is frequent english for lodgings words like frisk and pump and sump and go-cart might be included to illustrate certain americanizations there are various vanity fair and conde nasty contributions to american undies for underwear that deserve to be noted but if a few unconsidered trifles have escaped mr mencken think of what he has captured and mounted i like a belt more looser than what this one is well then why don't you unloosen it more than you got it unloosened to have an ear for this kind of speech to preserve and diagnose it is to do more than study the fauna and flora of language it is to set the foundations for a more salient national literature for what mr mencken says at the end of his fascinating and inspiring book is surely true the american dialect is now apprehended as something uncouth and comic but that is the way that new dialects always come in through a drumfire of cackles given the poet there may suddenly come a day when our therons and woodahads will take on the barbaric stateliness of the present locutions of old moriah in riders to the sea they seem grotesque and absurd to-day because the folks who use them seem grotesque and absurd but that is a too facile logic and under it is a false assumption in all human beings 
if only understanding be brought to the business dignity will be found and that dignity cannot fail to reveal itself soon or late in the words and phrases with which they make known their high hopes and aspirations and cry out against the intolerable meaninglessness of life beautifully said and this is the flame which mr mencken guards savagely from demons end of the living speech by f h from the new republic may thirty first nineteen nineteen demonstration that planets move in ellipses by sir isaac newton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org demonstration that planets move in ellipses by sir isaac newton hypothesis 1 bodies move uniformly in straight lines unless so far as they are retarded by the resistance of the medium or disturbed by some other force hypothesis two the alteration of motion is ever proportional to the force by which it is altered hypothesis three motions impressed in two different lines if those lines be taken in proportion to the motions and completed into a parallelogram compose a motion whereby the diagonal of the parallelogram shall be described in the same time in which the sides thereof would have been described by those compounding motions apart the motions a b and a c compound the motion a d proposition one if a body move in vacuo and be continually attracted toward an immovable centre it shall constantly move in one and the same plane and in that plane describe equal areas in equal times let a be the centre towards which the body is attracted and suppose the attraction acts not continually but by discontinued impressions made at equal intervals of time which intervals we will consider as physical moments let b c be the right line in which it begins to move from b and which it describes with uniform motion in the first physical moment before the attraction make its first impression upon it at c let it be attracted towards the centre a by one impulse or impression of force and let c d be the line in which it shall move after that impulse produce b c to i so that c i be equal to b c and draw i d parallel to c a and the point d in which it cuts c d shall be the place of the body at the end of the second moment and because the bases b c c i of the triangles a b c a c i are equal those two triangles shall be equal and because the triangles a c i a c d stand upon the same base a c and between two parallels they shall be equal and therefore the triangle ACD described in the second moment shall be equal to the triangle ABD described in the first moment. And by the same reason, if the body at the end of the second, third, fourth, fifth, and following moments be attracted by single impulses in D, E, F, G, etc., describing the line DE in the third moment, e f in the fourth f g in the fifth etc the triangle a e d shall be equal to the triangle a d c and all the following triangles a f e a g f and to the preceding ones and to one another and by consequence the areas compounded of these equal triangles as a b e a e g a b g etc are to one another as the times in which they are described suppose now that the moments of time be diminished in length and increased in number in infinitum 
so that the impulses or impressions of the attraction may become continual and that the line b c d e f g by the infinite number and infinite littleness of its sides b c c d d e etc may become a curve one and the body by the continual attraction shall describe areas of this curve a b e a e g a b g and proportional to the times in which they are described what was to be demonstrated proposition two if a body be attracted towards either focus of an ellipsis and the quantity of the attraction be such as suffices to make the body revolve in the circumference of the ellipsis the attraction at the two ends of the ellipsis shall be reciprocally as the squares of the body in those ends from that focus let a e c d be the ellipsis a c its two ends or vertices f that focus towards which the body is attracted and a f e c f d areas which the body with a ray drawn from that focus to its centre describes at both ends in equal times and those areas by the foregoing proposition must be equal because proportional to the times that is the rectangles one half a f times a e and one half f c times d c must be equal supposing the arches a e and c d to be so very short that they may be taken for right lines and therefore a e is to c d as f c to f a suppose now that a m and c n are tangents to the ellipses at its two ends a and c and that e m and d n are perpendiculars let fall from the points d and e upon those tangents and because the ellipsis is alike crooked at both ends those perpendiculars e m and d n will be to one another as the squares of the arches a e and c d and therefore e m is to d n as f c cubed to f a cubed now in the times that the body by means of the attraction moves in the arches a e and c d from a to e and from c to d it would without attraction move in the tangents from a to m and from c to n tis by the force of the attractions that the bodies are drawn out of the tangents from m to e and from n to d and therefore the attractions are as those distances m e and n d that is the attraction at the end of the ellipsis a is to the attraction at the other end of the ellipsis c as m e to n d and by consequence as f c cubed to f a cubed what was to be demonstrated lemma one if a right line touch an ellipsis in any point thereof and parallel to that tangent be drawn another right line from the centre of the ellipsis which shall intersect a third right line drawn from the touch point through either focus of the ellipsis the segment of the last named right line lying between the point of intersection and the point of contact shall be equal to half the long axis of the ellipsis let a p b q be the ellipsis a b its long axis c its center f small f its foci p the point of contact p r the tangent c d the line parallel to the tangent and p d the segment of the line f p i say that this segment shall be equal to a c for join p small f and draw small f e parallel to c d and because f small f is bisected in c f e shall be bisected in d and therefore two p d shall be equal to the sum of p f and p e that is to the sum of p f and p small f that is to a b 
and therefore PD shall be equal to AC. What was to be demonstrated? Lemma 2. Every line drawn through either focus of any ellipsis, and terminated at both ends by the ellipsis, is to that diameter of the ellipsis which is parallel to this line as the same diameter is to the long axis of the ellipsis. Let APBQ be the ellipsis, AB its long axis, F and small f its foci, C its center, PQ the line drawn through its focus F, and VCS its diameter parallel to PQ, and PQ will be to VS as VS to AB. For draw small f small p parallel to QFP, and cutting the ellipsis in small p, join P small p cutting VS in T, and draw PR which shall touch the ellipsis in P, and cut the diameter VS produced in R, and CT will be to CS as CS to CR, as has been showed by all those who treat of the conic sections. But CT is the semisum of FP and small f small p, that is, of FP and FQ, and therefore 2CT is equal to PQ. Also, 2CS is equal to VS, and, by the foregoing lemma, 2CR is equal to AB, wherefore PQ is to VS as VS to AB. What was to be demonstrated? Corollary AB times PQ equals VS cubed equals 4CS cubed. Lemma 3 if from either focus of any ellipsis unto any point in the perimeter of the ellipsis be drawn a right line, and another right line doth touch the ellipsis in that point, and the angle of contact be subtended by any third right line drawn parallel to the first line, the rectangle which that substance contains with the same substance produced to the other side of the ellipsis is to the rectangle which the long axis of the ellipsis contains with the first line produced to the other side of the ellipsis as the square of the distance between the subtends, and the first line is to the square of the short axis of the ellipsis. Let AKBL be the ellipsis, AB its long axis, KL its short axis, C its center, F, small f, its foci, P the point of the perimeter, PF the first line, PQ that line produced to the other side of the ellipsis, PX the tangent, XY the subtense produced to the other side of the ellipsis, and YZ the distance between this subtense and the first line. I say that the rectangle XYI is to the rectangle AB times PQ as YZ cubed to KL cubed. For let VS be the diameter of the ellipsis parallel to the first line PF and GH another diameter parallel to the tangent PX and the rectangle YXI will be to the square of the tangent PX cubed as the rectangle SCV to the rectangle GCH, that is, as SV cubed to GH cubed. This is a property of the ellipsis demonstrated by all that right of the conic sections. And they have also demonstrated that all the parallelograms circumscribed about an ellipsis are equal whence the rectangle 2PE times GH is equal to the rectangle AB times KL, and consequently GH is to KL as AB, that is, by lemma 1, 2PD to 2PE, and in the same proportion is PX to YZ. Whence PX is to GH as YZ to KL, 
and px cubed to gh cubed as yz cubed to kl cubed but yxi was to px cubed as sv cubed that is by corollary lemma two ab times pq to gh cubed whence invertedly yxi is to ab times pq as px cubed to gh cubed and by consequence as yz cubed to kl cubed what was to be demonstrated proposition three if a body be attracted towards either focus of any ellipsis and by that attraction be made to revolve in the perimeter of the ellipsis the attraction shall be reciprocally as the square of the distance of the body from that focus of the ellipsis let p be the place of the body in the ellipsis at any moment of time and px the tangent in which the body would move uniformly were it not attracted and x the place in that tangent at which it would arrive in any given part of time and y the place in the perimeter of the ellipsis at which the body doth arrive in the same time by means of the attraction let us suppose the time to be divided into equal parts and that those parts are very little ones so that they may be considered as physical moments and that the attraction acts not continually but by intervals once in the beginning of every physical moment and let the first action be upon the body in p the next upon it in y and so on perpetually so that the body may move from p to y in the chord of the arch p y and from y to its next place in the ellipsis in the chord of the next arch and so on for ever and because the attraction in p is made towards f and diverts the body from the tangent p x into the chord p y so that in the end of the first physical moment it be not found in the place x where it would have been without the attraction but in y being by the force of the attraction in p translated from x to y the line x y generated by the force of the attraction in p must be proportional to that force and parallel to its direction that is parallel to pf produce xy and pf till they cut the ellipses in i and q join fy and upon fp let fall the perpendicular yz and let ab be the long axis and kl the short axis of the ellipses and by the third lemma xyi will be to ab times pq as yz cubed to kl cubed and by consequence yx will be equal to ab times pq times yz cubed divided by xi times kl cubed and in like manner if small p small y be the chord of another arch small p small y which the revolving body describes in a physical moment of time and small p small x be the tangent of the ellipsis at small p and small x small y the substance of the angle of contact drawn parallel to small p f and if small p f and small x small y produced cut the ellipses in small q and small i and from small y upon small p f be let fall the perpendicular small y small z the subtense small y small x shall be equal to a b times small p small q times small y small z quadrupled divided by small x small i times k l quadrupled and therefore y x shall be to small y small x as a b times p q times y z cubed divided by x i times k l cubed 
2. AB times small p small q times small y small z quadrupled divided by small x small i times kl quadrupled that is as pq divided by xi times yz quadrupled to small p small q divided by small x small i times small y small z quadrupled and because the lines p y small p small y are by the revolving body described in equal times the areas of the triangles p y f small p small y f must be equal by the first proposition and therefore the rectangles p f times y z and p f times small y small z are equal and by consequence y z is to small y small z as small p f to p f whence p q divided by x i times y z cubed is to small p small q divided by small x small i times small y small z quadrupled as p q divided by x i small p f quadrupled to small p small q divided by small x small y times p f quadrupled and therefore y x is to small y x as p q divided by x i times small p f quadrupled to small p small q divided by small x small i times p f quadrupled and as we told you that x y was the line generated in a physical moment of time by the force of the attraction in p so for the same reason is small x small y the line generated in the same quantity of time by the force of the attraction in small p and therefore the attraction in p is to the attraction in small p as the line x y to the line small x small y that is as p q divided by x i times small p f quadrupled to small p small q divided by small x small i times p f quadrupled suppose now that the equal lines in which the revolving body describes the lines p y and small p y become infinitely little so that the attraction may become continual and the body by this attraction revolve in the perimeter of the ellipsis and the lines p q x y as also small p small q small x small i becoming coincident and by consequence equal the quantities p q divided by x i times small p f quadrupled and small p small q divided by small x small i times p f quadrupled will become small p f quadrupled and p f quadrupled and therefore the attraction in p will be to the attraction in small p as small p f cubed to p f cubed that is reciprocally as the squares of the distances of the revolving bodies from the focus of the ellipsis what was to be demonstrated end of demonstration that planets move in ellipses by sir isaac newton read by avai in october 2017「The Cartesian Demonstration of the Existence of God」from the French by Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz (1646–1716). This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. 
in truth metaphysics is natural theology and the same god who is the source of all good is also the principle of all knowledge this is because the idea of god embraces that of absolute being that is to say what is simple in our thoughts from which all that we think takes its origin descartes had not considered the matter from this side he gives two reasons of proving the existence of god the first is that there is in us an idea of god since we undoubtedly think of god and since we cannot think of anything without having the idea of it now if we have an idea of god and if it is a true one that is if it is of an infinite being and if it represents it faithfully it cannot be caused by anything less and consequently god himself must be its cause he must therefore exist the other argument is still shorter it is that god is a being which possesses all perfections and consequently possesses existence which is in the number of perfections hence he exists it must be confessed that these arguments are a little suspicious because they advance too quickly and do violence to us without enlightening us whereas true demonstrations are wont to fill the mind with some solid nourishment however it is difficult to find the knot of the matter and i see that a number of able men who have made objections to descartes have passed this by some have believed that there is no idea of god because he is not subject to the imagination supposing that idea and image are the same thing i am not of their opinion and i well know that there is an idea of thought and of existence and of similar things of which there is no image for we think of something and when we remark what made us recognize it this so far as it is in our soul is the idea of the thing this is why there is also an idea of what is not material or imaginable others admit that there is an idea of god and that this idea embraces all perfections but they cannot understand how existence follows from it be it because they do not admit that existing is of the number of perfections or because they do not see how a simple idea or thought can imply existence outside of us for myself i well believe that he who has acknowledged this idea of god and who fully sees that existence is a perfection ought to avow that this perfection belongs to god in fact i do not doubt the idea of god any more than his existence on the contrary i claim that i have a demonstration of it but i would not that we flatter ourselves and persuade ourselves that we could succeed in so great a matter at so little cost paralogisms are dangerous in this matter when they are not successful they rebound upon ourselves and strengthen the opposite party i say then that we must prove with all imaginable accuracy that there is an idea of an all-perfect being that is to say of god it is true that the objections of those who think that they can prove the contrary because there is no image of god are as i have just shown worthless but it must also be confessed that the proof which descartes offers for establishing the idea of god is imperfect how he will say can we speak of god without thinking of him and could we think of god without having the idea of him yes undoubtedly we sometimes think of impossible things and this has even been demonstrated for example descartes held that the quadrature of the circle is impossible and yet we do not cease to think of it and to draw consequences as to what would happen if it were possible motion of ultimate swiftness is impossible in any body whatever for if it were supposed in a circle for example another concentric circle surrounding the first and attached firmly to it would be moved with a velocity still greater than the first which consequently is not of the ultimate degree contrary to what we have supposed all this to the contrary notwithstanding we think of this ultimate swiftness which has no idea since it is impossible so the greatest of all circles is an impossible thing and a number made up of all possible units is no less so 
there is proof of it and nevertheless we think of all this this is why there is certainly room to doubt whether the idea of the greatest of all stars is to be trusted and whether it does not involve some contradiction for i well understand for example the nature of motion and of swiftness and what greatest is but for all that i do not understand whether all this is compatible and whether there is a way of joining all this and making therefrom an idea of the greatest swiftness of which motion is capable so although i know what star is and what largest and most perfect are nevertheless i do not yet know whether there is not a hidden contradiction in joining all these together as there is in fact in the other examples mentioned that is to say in a word i do not know for all this whether such a star is possible for if it were not there would be no idea of it however i confess that god in this respect has a great advantage over all other things for it is sufficient to prove that he is possible to prove that he exists a thing not encountered anywhere else that i know of furthermore i infer from this that there is a presumption that god exists for there is always a presumption on the side of possibility that is to say everything is held to be possible until its impossibility is proved there is therefore also a presumption that god is possible that is that he exists since in him existence is a consequence of the possibility this may suffice for practical life but it is not sufficient for a demonstration i have disputed much on this point with several cartesians but finally i have gotten some of the more able to frankly confess after having understood the force of my arguments that this possibility was still to be demonstrated there are even some who after being challenged by me have undertaken to demonstrate this but they have not yet completed it this was an extract from an undated letter to probably the grand duchess sophia End of on the cartesian demonstration of the existence of god seventeen hundred to seventeen o one from the french by gottfried wilhelm leibniz sixteen forty six to seventeen sixteen fruit soups by riley m fletcher berry this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org fruit soups fruit soups are usually served cold where convenient chilled on ice in very small china or glass bowls or bullion cups with this daintiness of service however it may be forgotten or not realised that such soups are not to the stomach mere empty introductory flourishes whatever the intent fruit soups are foods and as such are used in many countries even by peasants though they may lack delicate table appointments it is true that a fruit may be used which is not of itself substantial though the opposite may hold as with prunes but the sago arrowroot or tapioca used for thickening furnishes a certain amount of heat producing material and where wine is added this is increased so it may readily be understood why when used in quantity such combinations may approach of themselves substantial meals or why even in small measure fruit soups but with slight additions of food containing other balanced elements may arrive at the right to be chief dish of a luncheon or light supper as a general rule stewed fruit passed through a sieve may have added to it an equal quantity of water and to each pint a heaping teaspoon of scant dessert spoon of sago arrowroot for which cornstarch may be substituted or tapioca some instructors give the rule of a level tablespoon of cornstarch to each pint of clear pressed fruit juice which however may be slightly diluted 
the arrowroot or cornstarch is a quicker process and should be dissolved till smooth in a little cold water added when the fruit juice is at boiling point then cooked till clear meantime adding sugar and later a tablespoon of lemon juice or wine if sago or tapioca is used it must be cooked till thoroughly tender and translucent a fruit soup made of raspberries may serve as an example of a lighter fruit soup and the swedish of those more substantial end of fruit soups by riley m fletcher berry read for librivox dot org by melanie t a letter on pear tree blight by professor j p kirtland this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. East Rockport, Ohio, October 28, 1876 Dear Sir, I have recently read your interesting and instructive report on the pear tree blight allow me to congratulate you on having probably discovered the origin and nature of that malady a malady that has hereto baffled the investigations of the scientific and practical pomologists a knowledge of the pathology of a disease of the human system is often an important advancement towards effecting a cure or a prevention a remark equally applicable to diseases of the vegetable kingdom in the summer of 1812, while pursuing the study of medicine in Hartford, Connecticut, a low and malignant fever appeared and spread extensively in that city. Athletic soldiers in the United States cantonment, as well as citizens, were frequently one hour apparently in the enjoyment of perfect health, and in the next sinking into the arms of death perhaps before remedies could be applied coincident with the spreading of that epidemic among the human family blight appeared extensively in the pear orchards trees were attacked of all ages some dating back to provincial times and of size equalling those occasionally met with at this day on the banks of the detroit river the remains of french planting in or before the times of the pontiac its attacks were as sudden as those of the sinking fever and resulted suddenly in either the death of the trees or of extensive impairment public attention was greatly awakened by its ravages and as ignorance of its cause prevailed and in want of an explanatory hypothesis the public generally concluded that it was the same pestilence which walketh in darkness that was alike laying its heavy hand on the people and the pear trees this indefinite hypothesis prevailed for a time till in its succession it was displaced by that of insect depredation frost impression and fungoid poison neither of these suggested any practical means of relief from the evil since that period sixty-four years i have attentively watched the progress of the blight in different and remote parts of our country and noted numerous facts bearing on the subject your views seem to embrace a well-founded theory of the cause of the disease which indicates appropriate methods for preventing or counteracting it more phenomena attending its rise and progress are thereby explained than by any or all the hypotheses hereto advanced i am happy to add that my own experience during that long interval of time trivial as it may have been sustains their correctness if they be correct of which little doubt can be entertained it is highly important that they should be extensively diffused among practical pomologists no specific is at present known yet evidences are not wanting that an energetic and persevering course of management will do much to remedy the evil of this disorder the cultivar must take into consideration the character and selection of the variety of the fruit seckel and winter nellis rarely blight the soil and its condition in relation to drainage and moisture special manures cultivation or non-cultivation of the ground shading and protection from the sun 
and from a south and southwestern exposure, mulching, freeing the bodies from old and rough bark, and washing annually with a solution of soda ash, correct pruning of the season's growth in autumn, and pinching off the top of each limb before the formation of the terminal bud in late June, and other items too numerous to mention. Incidentally, it may be added that the cultivator should learn to gather his fruits at the moment the stem will cleave from the spur without fracture and to ripen them in a dry room. Each individual winter or autumn pear must be, immediately after gathering, wrapped in a separate paper as oranges are preserved and packed not over three layers deep in either drawers, boxes or crooks, placed in a dry and empty room if the rind be allowed to wilt before the wrapping and packing be accomplished the fine qualities of the variety will never develop bishop herber wrote that he found none of the east india fruits as palatable as those of temperate europe a baron de anjou d lycurgus or winternellus thus ripened will favourably compare with the orange guava and pineapples of the tropics much is yet to be learned in the art and science of pear cultures very respectfully yours, Jared P. Kirtland. End of a letter on pear tree blight by Professor J. P. Kirtland. Read for LibriVox.org by Melanie T. Lorenzo de Medici Rules in Florence by Oliphant Smeaton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Lorenzo de' Medici, Rules in Florence, Zenith of Florentine Glory, A.D. 1469, by Oliphant Smeaton. During the 12th century, several of the Italian cities, especially Florence and Venice, rose to great wealth and power venice through her favorable situation became pre-eminent in commerce while florence was coming to be the most important industrial center of europe in the thirteenth century florence was the scene of continual strife between the gulfs and the ghibellines but she not only continued to develop in material prosperity but also attained to intellectual activities whereby in the next century she gained a higher distinction she took the foremost part in the renaissance and was the birthplace or the home of dante boccaccio and other leaders of the modern movement in the fifteenth century florence reached a still loftier eminence under the medici a family celebrated for the statesman which it produced and for its patronage of letters and art its most illustrious members were cosmo thirteen eighty nine to fourteen sixty four and his grandson lorenzo surnamed the magnificent lorenzo was born january first in fourteen forty nine when the second great period of the renaissance was nearing its close that was the period of arrangement and translation the epoch of the formation of the great italian libraries the age when in florence around his grandfather cosmo in rome around pope nicholas v and in naples around alfonso the magnanimous coteries of the leading humanists were gathered engaged in labors which have made posterity eternally their debtors conjointly with his younger brother giuliano lorenzo on the death of his father piero in fourteen sixty nine succeeded to the vast wealth and political power of the family in fourteen seventy eight the death of giuliano left lorenzo sole ruler of florence to few men has either the power or the opportunity been given to influence their epoch intellectually and politically to a degree so marked as was the lot of lorenzo de medici one of the most marvelously many-sided of the many-sided men who adorned the italy of the fifteenth century he did more to place florence in the forefront of the world's culture than any other citizen who claimed val di arno as his birthplace his influence was great because he was in sympathy so catholic 
with all the varied life of his age and circle while during the one hour he would be found learnedly discussing the rival claims of the platonic and aristotelian philosophers with piscino and landino the next might witness him the foremost reveller in the florentine carnival crowned with flowers and with the wine-cup in his hand gaily caroling the ballad he had composed for the occasion while the third might behold him surrounded by the leading painters and sculptors of tuscany discoursing profoundly on the aims and mission of art truly a unique personality at one and the same time the glorious creation and the splendid epitome of the spirit of the renaissance when lorenzo de medici consented to assume the position occupied by his father piero and his grandfather cosmo he was not the raw youth his immature years would lead one to suppose although intellectual maturity is reached at an earlier age in the sunny south than in the fog-haunted lands of northern europe lorenzo had enjoyed a long apprenticeship before being called to undertake the duties devolving on him as the uncrowned king of florence from his thirteenth year he had been the companion and shared the counsels first of his grandfather and father and subsequently of his father alone from the former especially he learned many important lessons in statecraft the matter is open to question however if any advice had more far-reaching results or was laid more carefully to heart than this which is contained in more than one of cosmo's letters Quote, never stint your favors to the cause of learning and cultivate sedulously the friendship of scholars and humanists Unquote. towards such a course lorenzo's inclinations as well as his interests pointed and during his life florence was the athens not only of italy but of europe as a whole here among many others were to be found such epoch makers as poliziano piccino and landino pico della mirandola leo battista alberti michelangelo luigi pozzi men who glorified their age by crowning it with the nimbus of their genius the literary and artistic greatness of florence was not due however to the comparative intellectual poverty of the other states in italy florence was only primus inter pares greatest among many that were great when the fact is recalled that such contemporaries as pomponius Letus, bartolomeo sacchi molza alessandro farnese paul III, platina sabellicus at rome pontinus sanazaro and porcello in naples and pomponasso and boiardo at ferrara were then at or nearing their prime the position of florence as the acknowledged centre of european culture was conceded by sense of right alone then this nothing proves more emphatically the strides learning had been making it was no longer the prerogative of the few but the privilege of the many from the first lorenzo recognized what a strong card he held in the affection and respect of the italian as well as of the florentine humanists the great secret of lorenzo's preeminence in european and italian as well as in tuscan politics lies in the fact that he was able to unite the sources of administrative legislative and judicial power in himself all the public offices in florence were held by his dependents and so entirely was the state machinery controlled by him that we find such men as louis xi and the emperor maximilian alfonso of naples and pope innocent the eighth recognizing his authority and appealing to him personally in place of to the seigneury to effect the ends they desired such power enabled him to avoid the risks his grandfather cosmo had been compelled to run to maintain his authority the medician faction was better in hand than in his grandfather's debts and lorenzo therefore in playing the role of the peacemaker of italy at the time when he held the balance of power through his treaties with milan naples and ferrara could speak with a decision 
that carried weight when he found it necessary to threaten a restless despot with a political combination that might depose him lorenzo's services to learning were inspired by feelings infinitely more noble than those actuating his political plans a patriotism as lofty as it was beneficent led him to desire that his country should be in the van of italian progress and renaissance studies his sagacious provision enabled him to proportion the nature and extent of the benefit he conferred to the need it was intended to supply many statesmen do more harm than good by failing to appreciate this law of supply and demand they grant more than is required and that which should have been a boon becomes a burden charles v at the time of the reformation on more than one occasion committed this error as also did wolsey and mazarin lorenzo like richelieu recognized the value of moderation in giving and caused every favor to be regarded as a possible earnest of others to come the earlier years of his power were associated with many stirring events which exercised no inconsiderable influence on the state of learning for example his skilful playing off of duke galezzo maria sforza of milan against ferranti king of naples led to greater attention being directed by the florentines to neapolitan and milanese affairs with the result that humanists and artists from both these places paid frequent visits to florence where they were welcomed by lorenzo as his guests then when the revolt of the small city of volterra from florentine rule was suppressed by lorenzo's agents with a rigorous severity that cast a stain on their master's name owing to many unoffending scholars having suffered to the extent of losing their all lorenzo made noble amends not only did he generously assist the inhabitants to repair their losses not only did he make grants to the local scholars and send them copies of many of the codices in his own library to supply the loss of their books which had been burned by the soldiery but he purchased large estates in the neighborhood that the citizens might benefit by his residence among them in this way too he brought the volterran scholars into more intimate relations with the florentine humanists and thus contributed to the further diffusion of the benefits of the renaissance all was not plain sailing however as regards the progress of the new learning despite his efforts lorenzo could not prevent its development being checked during the papal neapolitan quarrel with florence that war originated in a dispute with pope sixtus iv who kept italy in a ferment during the whole duration of his pontificate fourteen seventy one to fourteen eighty four were no other proof forthcoming of lorenzo's marvellous diplomatic genius than this one fact that he checkmated the political schemes of sixtus and finally so neutralized his influence as to render him well-nigh impotent for evil-doing such an achievement was sufficient to stamp him one of the greatest masters of statecraft europe has known in any estimate of his ability we must take into account the unsatisfactory character of many of the instruments wherewith he had to achieve his purposes and also the fact that he had neither a great army at his back with which to enforce the fulfilment of treaty obligations for florence never was a city of soldiers nor had he the prestige of an official position to lend weight to his words to all intents and purposes he was a private citizen of the florentine republic yet such was the dynamic power of the man's marvellous personality and yet the reputation he had earned even in his early years for supreme prescience and far-reaching diplomatic subtlety that far and wide he was regarded as the greatest force in italian politics sixtus sallied forth to crush he returned to the vatican a crushed and discredited man to die of sheer chagrin over his defeat by lorenzo in his designs upon ferrara then followed the memorable dispute in fourteen seventy two to fourteen seventy three over the bishopric of pisa 
when the pope's nominee francesco salviati was refused possession of the sea pisa being one of the tuscan towns under the control of florence to this sixtus retaliated by seeking the friendship of ferranti of naples a move lorenzo anticipated by forming the league between florence milan and venice this league thoroughly alarmed both the pope and ferrante and on the latter visiting rome in fourteen seventy five a papal neapolitan alliance was formed even then hostilities might not have broken out had the young duke of milan not been assassinated in fourteen seventy six leaving an infant heir this entailed a long minority with all its dangers and the apprehensions regarding these were not fanciful inasmuch as lodovico sforza uncle of the baby duke usurped the position under pretext of acting as regent these crimes were plainly responsible for the pazzi conspiracy in fourteen seventy eight against the medici themselves a conspiracy which resulted in giuliano the younger brother of lorenzo being murdered in the cathedral during mass on the sunday before ascension while lorenzo himself was slightly wounded that sixtus and his nephew were accessories before the fact is now regarded as unquestionable the vengeance taken by the enraged florentines on the conspirators their relatives friends and property was terrible the innocent alas being sacrificed indiscriminately with the guilty the archbishop of pisa francesco salviati had entered eagerly into the scheme and although his sacred office prevented him from actually assisting in the deed he was present in the cathedral until the signal was given for the perpetration of the deed when he left the building to secure the palazzo publico he was therefore summarily hanged with the others from the windows of the civic buildings sixtus made the execution or the murder as he called it of salviati his pretext for calling on his allies to make war on florence when he saw however that this action was only throwing the city more completely than ever into the arms of the medici he changed his tactics and said he had no quarrel with quote, his well-beloved children of florence unquote, but only with quote, that son of iniquity and child of perdition lorenzo de medici unquote and those who had aided and abetted him among whom the humanists were expressly mentioned against lorenzo and his associates a brief of excommunication was launched and the city was urged to regain the papal favor by surrendering the offenders the result might have been predicted the brief only tended to knit the bonds of association closer between lorenzo and the city of the flower while the humanists to a man rallied round their patron even the choleric filelfo now a very old man who had been on anything but friendly terms with the medici addressed two bitter satires to sixtus in which the pope was styled the real aggressor while the great humanist offered to write a history of the whole transaction that posterity might know the true facts the only power which gave its adhesion to sixtus was naples while venice ferrara and milan declared for florence thus commenced that tedious war which not only ruined so many florentine merchants but retarded the cause of learning so materially when the people were groaning under heavy taxes when all coin which lorenzo could scrape together had to be poured out to pay the condottieri or soldiers of fortune by whom the battles of florence were fought there was of course but short commons for the humanists who had made florence their home many of those adapted themselves to circumstances but others to whom money was their god left the banks of the arno for those southern cities where the pinch of scarcity did not prevail in this campaign the florentines gained but little prestige the larger share of the cost was quietly suffered by their allies to fall on the city of bankers the milanese were occupied with their own affairs owing to the coup d'etat accomplished by lodovico sforza the duke of ferrara withdrew 
owing to some disagreement with the condottieri engaged by lorenzo the venetians only dispatched a small contingent under carlo montone and de febo de anguillari accordingly in the end the whole burden of the struggle fell on florence the magnifico's position gradually became precarious inasmuch as many persons declared the war to be in reality a personal quarrel between pope sixtus and the medici complaints began to be heard that the public treasury was exhausted and the commerce of the city ruined while the citizens were burdened with oppressive taxes lorenzo had the mortification of being told that sufficient blood had been shed and that it would be expedient for him rather to devise some means of effecting a peace than of making further preparations for the war in these circumstances and confronted by one of the most dangerous crises of his whole life lorenzo rose to the occasion and effected a solution of the difficulty by daring to perform what was undoubtedly one of the bravest acts ever achieved by a diplomatist by some statesmen it might be condemned as foolhardy by others as quixotic its very foolhardiness and, and quixotry fascinated the man it was intended to influence the bloodthirsty cruel and pitiless ferranti of naples who was restrained from crime by the fear neither of god nor man and who had actually slain the cognitaire piccinino when he visited him under a safe conduct from the monarch's best ally but the renaissance annals are filled with the records of men and women whose natures are marvellous studies of contrasted and contradictory traits such was the neapolitan tyrant while a monster in much he had his vulnerable points he was ambitious to pose as a friend of the new learning and he knew that lorenzo was not only the most munificent patron but also one of the most illustrious exponents of the renaissance principles although his enemy ferranti received lorenzo with every demonstration of respect and satisfaction he lost sight of the hostile diplomatist and the great humanist two neapolitan galleys were sent to conduct him to naples and he was welcomed on landing with much pomp never did lorenzo's supreme diplomatic genius never did his versatile powers as a statesman as a scholar as a patron of letters and as a brilliant man of the world blaze forth in more splendid effulgence than during his three months stay in naples though opposed by all the papal authority and resources though sixtus by turns threatened cajoled entreated promised in order to prevent lorenzo having any success the successor of st peter was beaten all along the line and the magnifico carried away with him a treaty signed and sealed which practically meant that henceforth naples and the papacy would be in antagonistic camps it was the renaissance card which won the trick with startling boldness yet with consummate art lorenzo played the game of flattering ferranti no ordinary adulation however would have had success with the neapolitan phalaris he was too strong-minded a man for anything of that kind but to be hailed by the great renaissance patron of the period by one also who was himself one of the leading humanists as a brother humanist and a fellow patron of learning was a delicate incense to his vanity which he could not resist he liked to be consulted on matters of literary moment and when he blundered lorenzo was too shrewd a student of human nature to correct him another fact in lorenzo's favor was that he had the warm support not only of the beautiful ippolita maria daughter of cosmo's friend francesco sforza of milan and now wife of alfonso duke of calabria king ferranti's heir as well as don federigo the monarch's younger son who along with ippolita was a friend to the new learning but he also had the whole body of neapolitan humanists on his side scarce one of whom but had experienced in some form or another the medicine bounty such powerful advocacy was not without its influence in bringing about the result while ferranti more and more realized that if the florentine medici were crushed 
he would have no ally to whom to look for help when the inevitable shuffle of the political cards took place on the death of sixtus in february fourteen eighty therefore lorenzo returned in triumph to florence to be received with rapture by his fellow citizens had he delayed a few months longer his visit and his admissory cordium appeals would not have been needed in august of that year kadok ahmed one of the turkish sultans mohammed second ablest generals besieged and took the city of otranto in face of the common danger to all italy sixtus was compelled to accept the treaty made by ferranti with lorenzo and a general peace ensued the decade accordingly closed with an absolution for all offences granted by the pope to florence conditional on the tuscan republic contributing its share to the expenses of the military preparations to resist the invasion of the turk notwithstanding the war the progress of the renaissance during the first decade of lorenzo's rule was very marked to the rapid diffusion of printing this was largely due lorenzo had not imbibed the prejudices against the new art entertained by cosmo and federico of montefeltro he looked at the practical not the sentimental side of the question as regards the new invention having seen that the press could throw off in a few days scores of copies of any work of which it took an amanuensis months to produce one also that the scholars of all italy could be furnished almost immediately and at a low price with the text of any manuscript they desired while they had to wait months for a limited number of copies whose cost was well nigh prohibitive he supported the new invention from the outset having resolved to further his father's efforts to establish printing in florence he stimulated the local goldsmith bernardo cennini to turn his attention to typecasting in metal and even agreed to pay him an annual grant from the year fourteen seventy one until he had fairly settled himself in business nor did he confine his favours to him john of mainz and nicholas of breslau who arrived in florence the former in fourteen seventy two and the latter in fourteen seventy seven also participated in his open-hearted liberality printing struck its roots deep into the tuscan community and flourished excellently though the florentine craft never attained the reputation of the venetian aldi and assolani the gianti of rome the sancini of fano the stefani of paris and froben of basil it had the name for a time at least of being one of the most accurate of all presses to lorenzo it owed this celebrity at an early date he perceived that the new art would be of little value if there were not careful press readers he was therefore among the first to induce scholars of distinction to engage in this task for example he enlisted the aid of cristoforo landino who in his disputationis comodinensis had really inaugurated the science of textual criticism by urging that a careful comparison of the various codices should constitute the preliminary step in any reproduction of the classics landino's work on virgil and horace merits the warmest praise lorenzo also impressed palaziano into the work whose labours in marking the various readings and adding scolia and notes illustrative of the text of catullus propertius ovid etc were of the utmost value to lorenzo and to his younger brother giuliano another great humanist giorgio marula of milan dedicated his plautus published in venice in fourteen seventy two showing at how early an age the magnifico had taken his place among the recognized patrons of the italian renaissance we ought not moreover to omit mention of another achievement of lorenzo though performed in a sphere of effort lying outside of the strict limits of our renaissance survey seeing it was the revival of letters however which induced the revival of the cultivation of the vernacular italian literature surely it is not out of place to refer to it here early in life lorenzo became imbued with the conviction 
that his native tongue was unsurpassed as a medium for quote, the expression of noble thoughts in noble numbers unquote. not only did he encourage others to study dante petrarch and boccaccio but by following out his own precepts he became one of the great italian poets his salve di amore his corinto his ambra his lanencia di barbarino his laud his sonetti his canzoni etc are all poems that live in the italian literature of to-day not as a man ashamed of the vernacular and forced to use it because he can command no better does lorenzo write Quote, he is sure of the justice of his cause and determined by precept and example and by the prestige of his princely rank to bring the literature he loves into repute again but of these poems we cannot here take further note by the scholars of the renaissance such work was looked askance at if they did produce any of these trifles as they were called they almost blushed to own them and were ashamed to communicate them to each other that he dared to be natural says much for lorenzo and it was largely due to his encouragement that cristoforo landino undertook his great work on dante to which we owe so much to-day in conjunction with his patronage of printing there was no line of effort in which lorenzo did more real good than in collecting manuscripts and antiquities and in making them practically public property on this account he is styled by Nico, by nicolo leoncino lorenzo de medici the great patron of learning in this age whose messengers are dispersed through every part of the earth for the purpose of collecting books on every science and who has spared no expense in procuring for your use and that of others who may devote themselves to some of our studies the materials necessary for your purpose unquote. the agents he employed travelled through italy greece europe and the east hieronimo donato armaleo barbero and paolo Cortese, being the names of some of his most trusted commissioners but the co-adjutor whose aid he principally relied on to whom he committed the care and arrangement of his vast museum and great library was palaziano who himself made frequent excursions throughout europe asia and northern africa to discover and purchase such remains of antiquity as suited the purpose of his patron another successful agent though at a later date was giovanni lascaris who twice journeyed into the east in search of manuscripts and curios in the second of these he brought back upward of two hundred copies of valuable codices from the monasteries on mount Athos. to still another service rendered by lorenzo in to the cause of the renaissance attention must be called the founding of the florentine academy for the study of greek this institution distinct be it remembered from the ufficiali dello studio or high school exercised a marvellous influence on the progress of the new learning accordingly as roscoe says succeeding scholars have been profuse in their acknowledgments to lorenzo who first formed the establishment from which to use their own classical figure as from the trojan horse so many illustrious champions have sprung and by means of which the knowledge of the greek tongue was extended not only throughout italy but throughout europe as well from all the countries of which numerous pupils flocked to florence pupils who afterward carried the learning they had received to their native lands of this institution the first public professor was joannes agri or gyropolis who having enjoyed the patronage of cosmo and piero and directed the education of lorenzo was selected by the latter as the fittest person to be the earliest occupant of the chair during his tenure of it he sent out such pupils as palaziano donato axia ioli janus panonius and the famous german humanist Rutlin. our gyropolis did not hold the appointment long his death took place at rome in fourteen seventy one 
and he was succeeded first by theodore of gaza and then by chocondylus Polixiano certainly discharged the duties of the office frequently but at first only as locum tenens he was then almost incessantly engaged in travelling for his patron in greece and asia minor and was too valuable a coadjutor to be tied down to the routine of teaching until he had completed his work during the next decade he became the professor and discharged the duties with a genius and an adaptability to circumstances that won for him the admiration and love of all his students End of Lorenzo de Medici Rules in Florence by Oliphant Smeaton. Mount Everest, The Reconnaissance, 1921, Chapter 17, The Route to the Summit, by George H. Lee Mallory. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The reader who has carefully followed the preceding story will hardly have failed to notice that the route which has been chosen as the only one offering reasonable chances of success remains still very largely a matter of speculation. But the reconnaissance, unless it were actually to reach the summit, was obliged to leave much unproved and its value must depend upon observations in various sorts and not merely upon the practice of treading the snow and rocks speculation in this case is founded upon experience of certain phenomena and a study of the mountain's features and it is by relating what has been only seen with known facts that inferences have been drawn it may perhaps be accounted a misfortune that the party of 1921 did not approach Chang La by the East Rongbuk Glacier. The Lokpok La proved a bigger obstacle than was expected, but in conditions such as we had hoped to find before the monsoon, this way would have had much to recommend it. It avoids all the laborious walking on a dry glacier and with hard snow the walk up to the pass from the camp on stones at twenty thousand feet should not be unduly fatiguing still the fact remains that the descent from the lock pa la on to the east rongbuck glacier is not less than twelve hundred feet would it not be better to follow up this glacier from the rongbuck valley the absence of wood on this side need not deter the party of nineteen twenty two for them plenty of time will be available sufficiently to provide their base with fuel and the sole consideration should be the easiest line of approach and though no one has traversed the whole length of the east rongbuck glacier enough is known to choose this way with confidence here as on other glaciers which we saw the difficulties clearly lie below the limit of perpetual snow and the greater part of them were avoided or solved by major wheeler who found a practicable way onto the middle of the glacier at about nineteen thousand feet and felt certain that the medial moraine ahead of him would serve for an ascent and be no more arduous than the moraines on the west rongbuck glacier had proved to be the view of this way from the lock pa la confirmed his opinion and though it may be called a speculation to choose it whereas the way from the east had been established by experiment it is a fair inference from experience to conclude that the untraversed section of the east rongbuck glacier a distance which could be accomplished very easily in one march if all went well will afford a simple approach to chang la the eastern wall about one thousand feet high by which the gap itself must be reached can never be lightly esteemed here reconnaissance has forged a link but those who reached the coal were not laden with tents and stores and on another occasion the conditions may be different there may be the danger of an avalanche or the difficulty of ice from what we saw this year before the monsoon had brought a heavy snowfall it is by no means improbable that ice will be found at the end of may on the steepest slope below chang la in that case much labor will be required to hew and keep in repair a staircase and perhaps fix a banister 
so that the laden coolies not all of whom will be competent ice men may be brought up in safety the summit of mount everest is about six thousand feet above chang la the distance is something like two and a half miles and the whole of it is unexplored what grounds have we for thinking that the mountaineering difficulties will not prove insuperable that in so far as mere climbing is concerned the route is practicable two factors generally speaking have to be considered the nature of the ground and the general angle of inclination where the climber is confined to a narrow crest and can find no way to circumvent an obstacle a very small tower or wall a matter of twenty feet may bar his progress there the general angle may be what it likes the important matter for him is that the angle is too steep in a particular place but on a mountain's face where his choice is not limited to a strict and narrow way the general angle is of primary importance if it is sufficiently gentle the climber will find that he may wander almost where he will to avoid the steeper places long before we reached chang la mr bullock and i were fairly well convinced that the slope from here to the northeast shoulder was sufficiently gentle and that the nature of the ill-defined ridge connecting these two points was not such as to limit the choice of route to a narrow line looking up from the north coal we learnt nothing more about the angles the view however was not without value it amply confirmed our opinion as to the character of what lay ahead of us the ridge is not a crest its section is a wide and rounded angle it is not decorated by pinnacles it does not rise in steps it presents a smooth continuous way and whether the rocks are still covered with powdery snow or only slightly sprinkled and for the most part bare the party of nineteen twenty two should be able to go up a long way at all events without meeting any serious obstacle it may not prove a perfectly simple matter actually to reach the northeast arete above the shoulder at about twenty eight thousand feet the angle becomes steeper towards this arete but even in the last section below it the choice of a way should not be inconveniently restricted on the right of the ascending party will be permanent snow on various sloping ledges an easy alternative to rocks if the snow is found in good condition and always offering a detour by which to avoid an obstacle from the northeast shoulder to the summit of the mountain the way is not so smooth the rise is only one thousand feet in a distance of half a mile but the first part of the crest is distinctly jagged by several towers and the last part is steep much will depend upon the possibility of escaping from the crest to avoid the obstacles and of regaining it easily the southeast side left going up is terribly steep and it will almost certainly be out of the question to traverse there but the sloping snow-covered ledges on the northwest may serve very well the difficulty about them is their tendency to be horizontal in direction and to diverge from the arete where it slopes upwards so that a party which had followed one in preference to the crest might find themselves cut off by a cliff running across the face above them but one way or another i think it should be possible with the help of such ledges to reach the final obstacle the summit itself is like the thin edge of a wedge thrust up from the mass in which it is embedded the edge of it with the highest point at the far end can only be reached from the northeast by climbing a steep blunt edge of snow the height of this final obstacle must be fully two hundred feet mr bullock and i examined it often through our field glasses and though it did not appear insuperable whatever our point of view it never looked anything but steep to determine whether it is humanly possible to climb to the summit of mount everest or what may be the chances of success in such an undertaking other factors besides the mere mountaineering difficulties have to be considered it is at least probable that the obstacles presented by this mountain could be overcome by any competent party if they met them in the alps but it is a very different matter to be confronted with such obstacles at elevations between twenty three thousand and twenty nine thousand feet 
we do not know that it is physiologically possible at such high altitudes for the human body to make the efforts required to lift itself up even on the simplest ground the condition of the party of nineteen twenty one in september during the days of the assault cannot be taken as evidence that the feat is impossible the long periods spent in high camps and the tax of many exhausting expeditions had undoubtedly reduced the physical efficiency of sahibs and coolies alike the party of nineteen twenty two on the other hand will presumably choose for their attempt a time when the climbers are at the top of their form and their powers will depend on the extent of their adaptability to the condition of high altitude nothing perhaps was so astonishing in the party of reconnaissance as the rapidity with which they became acclimatized and capable of great exertions between eighteen thousand and twenty one thousand feet where is the limit of this process will the multiplication of red corpuscles continue so that men may become acclimatized much higher there is evidence enough to show that they may exist comfortably enough eating and digesting hearty meals and retaining a feeling of vitality and energy up to twenty three thousand feet it may be that after two or three days quietly spent at this height the body would sufficiently adjust itself to endure the still greater difference from normal atmospheric pressure six thousand feet higher at all events a practical test can alone provide the proof in such a case experiments carried out in a laboratory by putting a man into a sealed chamber and reducing the pressure say to half an atmosphere valuable as they may be when related to the experiences of airmen can establish nothing for mountaineers for they leave out of account the all-important physiological factor of acclimatization but in any case it is to be expected that efforts above twenty three thousand feet will be more exhausting than those at lower elevations and it may well be that the nature of the ground will turn the scale against the climber for him it is all important that he should be able to breathe regularly the demand upon his lungs along the final arete cannot fail to be a terrible strain and anything like a tussle up some steep obstacle which would interfere with the regularity of his breathing might prove to be an ordeal beyond his strength as a way out of these difficulties of breathing the use of oxygen has been recommended and experiments were made by dr kellis which will be continued in nineteen twenty two even so there will remain the difficulty of establishing one or perhaps two camps above chang la twenty three thousand feet it is by no means certain that any place exists above this point on which tents could be pitched perhaps the party will manage without tents but no great economy of weight will be effected that way those who sleep out at an elevation of twenty five or twenty six thousand feet will have to be bountifully provided with warm things probably about fifteen or at least twelve loads will have to be carried up from chang la it is not expected that the oxygen will be available for this purpose and the task whatever organization is provided will be severe possibly beyond the limits of human strength further another sort of difficulty will jeopardize the chances of success it might be possible for two men to struggle somehow to the summit disregarding every other consideration it is a different matter to climb the mountain as mountaineers would have it climbed principles time honored in the alpine club must of course be respected in the ascent of mount everest the party must keep a margin of safety it is not to be a mad enterprise rashly pushed on regardless of danger the ill-considered acceptance of any and every risk has no part in the essence of persevering courage a mountaineering enterprise may keep sanity and sound judgment and remain an adventure and of all principles by which we hold the first is that of mutual help what is to be done for a man who is sick or abnormally exhausted at these high altitudes his companions must see to it that he is taken down at the first opportunity and with an adequate escort and the obligation is the same whether he be sahib or coolie if we ask a man to carry our loads up the mountain we must care for his welfare at need it may be taken for granted that such need will arise 
and will interfere very seriously with any organization however ingeniously and carefully it may be arranged in all it may be said that one factor beyond all others is required for success too many chances are against the climbers too many contingencies may turn against them anything like a breakdown of the transport will be fatal soft snow on the mountain will be an impregnable defence a big wind will send back the strongest even so small a matter as a boot fitting a shade too tight may endanger one man's foot and involve the whole party in retreat the climbers must have above all things if they are to win through good fortune and the greatest good fortune of all for mountaineers some constant spirit of kindness in mount everest itself the forgetfulness for long enough of its more cruel moods for we must remember that the highest of mountains is capable of severity a severity so awful and so fatal that the wiser sort of men do well to think and tremble even on the threshold of their high endeavour end of mount everest the reconnaissance nineteen twenty one chapter seventeen the route to the summit by george h lee mallory read by phil schampf